back today to talk about something that I've been thinking about recently. Um, it's kind of going off of the video that I made about is F.I. really deep? Is F.E. really shallow? Um, where I was talking about how F.I. is deep in the sense MBTI F.I., not socionics. Um, but actually, kind of a little bit socionics anyway. Just know that I'm talking about Myers-Briggs um, uh, typology for the most part. And we'll get more into the reason of why I have to clarify that probably in another video. But essentially, MBTI, Myers-Briggs, um, FI. Um, I believe that it's deep and nuanced in the way that we understand our own feelings and human emotion and values. Um, but FE, I believe that it's deep and nuanced in the sense of interpersonal dynamics. Um, and so... If you guys want to learn like more about what I thought about that, you can go ahead and check out that video. Um, but after discovering that, um, I went ahead and just out of curiosity wanted to look into what I thought were the three forms of Greek love. Um, like in Christianity, I've always heard of like, you know, like agape and then eros and then I believe it was philia. Um, but then as I started trying to do like research on it, um, I ended up seeing that there's actually eight, um, and I've been doing research about that. I've been having conversations with a few people about it and it's just been pretty mind blowing because once again, I feel like this is something that in my head I've realized and maybe many of you have also realized, especially in my opinion, if you're an FE user. But because it's not as prominent in our society right now, then we tend to like overlook it. So I have a big problem personally with us making um, interpersonal connections romantic when I feel like they probably shouldn't be or they just aren't romantic. Instead, they just have a deeper connection. Like, for example, I had a friend who um, she and this guy friend of hers, they were really close and she was considering if they should go out. Um, and she was talking to me about it and she was so stressed out. She was, and she was an INFJ and this was an ENFP. And she was like, yeah, and so like, I, I just don't know. Like, I, 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 I don't think that I like him romantically, but I've never felt this way about someone before. We just have such a deep connection. Um, like, and I was like, you do know that deep connection does not necessarily mean that it's romantic, right? And that just kind of like blew her mind. But I was just like, yeah, like if that was the case, <laughs> then I'd be romantically attracted to several people, including men, and I'm 100% straight. So that just would not be the case. Um, but we have things in life now where it's like, you have guys who are afraid to get deep with each other, because they're afraid that it's gonna be seen as gay and like, you know, granted, we have now become more open, way more open to the idea of homosexuality and stuff, but still, it's a masculinity thing. Um, and guys, like you, you look at into the Bible, like David and Jonathan, it says that they had so close of a bond that their souls cleaved onto one another. And that's just beautiful in my opinion. But now we look at a lot of opinions of that reference today and people translate that as them ha having a homosexual relationship. And I feel like that's, oh, sorry, continuing. Um, and I feel like that's, that's just a reach. Like uh, I, I, I think that just because you're deeply connecting with someone does not mean that it's romantic. Um, and that goes for whether it's a heterosexual or um, homosexual interpersonal dynamic. And so, um, when you look at the Greeks, they actually believed in these eight forms of love, um, the ways that it comes about. And I found that very interesting because that goes to show they were looking at the nuance of the different ways that we can interact with each other or connect with one another. And um, I believe that different combinations of these loves that we're about to go over in this video is what creates certain types of dynamics. And so maybe after this video, you can now start observing your own dynamics with other people and realizing like, okay, it's a little bit of philia with a little bit of 
Ludus, and then there's some Falasha. So this must be maybe, is this platonic? Is this romantic? You know, like it's not necessarily as binary as we think, black and white as we think. So that's just my quick foundation that I wanted to lay out for this video. And we're gonna go, we're gonna like hop right into the first of the eight, which is everyone's favorite to talk about. Eros. Okay, so Eros has pretty much the most to do with sexual passion. Um, Eros was the god of love and fertility, also the son of Ares, which was the god of war, and Aphrodite, the beauty, the, the goddess of beauty and eternal youth. He was pretty much personified as a young boy with a bow and arrow, and all of the Greek gods and goddesses were like afraid of him because it kind of actually sounds like Cupid, you know. Um, where this young boy who was like almost like immature with his bow and arrow that was capable of making people fall into a deep love or just an uh, overpassionate lust for one another. Um, and they were just trying to make sure they didn't get shot by this guy who was just trigger happy shooting his arrows at whoever he felt like shooting them towards. Um, so the Greeks were actually afraid of arrows energy because they saw it as very fleeting and it, they saw it as the impulse to procreate, which kind of sounds like the sexual instinct in a general sense um, when you look at the Enneagram. The Greeks also saw it as a loss of control. Um, and so this is another reason why they were very fearful of it. They saw Eros, like that type of Eros dynamic, um, Eros dynamic, Eros dynamic, anyway. They saw Eros kind of like a that that strong sexual passion and lust for someone or people um, that makes you lose control, which is ironically what a lot of us tend to look for today. Like, oh, I just want to lose myself in love with someone like, you know, those like very intense kind of like romances and everything. And Eros is not necessarily bad. But I believe that when you have it stripped away from some of the other ones and just on its own, that's when it can be the most dangerous. And especially if you add arrows with mania, a lot of you probably have witnessed such people um, or dynamics. A lot of you may even already be in that dynamic. A lot of you may already be that person. Um, and so, yeah, arrows is essentially pretty easy to grasp. It has the most to do directly with sexual passion and lust and just overall um, that impulse, that fleeting, um, that fleeting uh, proclivity to want to uh, have sex, to want to just lustfully do whatever <laughs> your mind can think of in that sense, that drive. Now, the second Greek form of love that we're going to talk about is called philia. Um, and this one is most known as kinship or a deep friendship. Um, it is platonic. And the reason why we call this platonic, by the way, is because Plato actually came up with a lot of these. Um, and Plato, Plato, when he talks about platonic relationships, which is a whole deeper thing, but just long story, like to be, make it generalized, um, Plato subtracted the physical element. He believed that in order to have a deep love um, for someone or deep appreciation or whatever, like love does not have to have that physical element there. And so from having that there, then uh, from having that physical element removed, that's what we would then essentially call platonic relationships. Um, and that doesn't go to show that, you know, like, oh, so as long as you have the physical element removed, there's no romance involved but um once again that's just kind of like a generalized view of that philia is also most associated with comrades people who have a brotherly kind of love or a love that's forged through hardship um and when i say brotherly that could also mean like sisterly too but like almost that type of love that like hey we've all we've all been through this war together and so now we've formed a bond between one another so that's why, you know, you have that camaraderie or camra camaraderie, uh, however the word is pronounced. <laughs> I've been reading a lot more than I've been actually hearing the words. Um, but yeah, that's why you have that. And it's most associated also with loyalty, sacrifice, and emotional sharing. So again, when you think of like people who go off to war together, um, that's just like the best example that I can think of. And these people do not know each other at all. And they've gone through a lot. 
lot of hardship together um, and they've survived certain things together and they've had moments now to kind of like bond and get closer. This is very deep kinship, very deep friendship, and this is what we call philia. Now, ludus is the third um, form of Greek love that we're going to be discussing today. Um, and it's most known for being playful, flirty, light, flirty, fun. And did I mention flirty? Yeah, flirty. It's very childlike. It's in, in, in its innocence of love. And it's really, it really, this is, this is also most associated with like banter and like even like dancing with strangers. So those are just like some examples. But ludus in general is like kind of like, um, you know, like the kind of relationship that maybe some friends would have with each other where they're like just like joking around like there's not like you can tell that there's not an actual romantic attraction there but they just like the interplay the um the tossing back and forth of this um kind of like playful flirtatious energy um and it's pretty much like harmless um so this does not necessarily mean that ludus cannot um, evolve into romantic um, but it I would just say that just because you're witnessing a ludus type of dynamic does not mean that those people are going to become romantic or are romantic at that moment however I do believe that every romantic relationship should have ludus in it because without ludus type of love well then um, where where is the excitement you know where is the thrill besides I mean you might be getting that from arrows um, but there should also be like that light flirtatious kind of joking around that you have like with your partner or if you're polyamorous partners um, and I think that that's that's something that's also admirable but especially even in friendships to be honest I think that having like ludus with some of your friends personally this is just my subjective opinion I think that, that builds for like a more fun and more playful uh, more friendly and open um, kind of friendship that people may have with one another. The fourth love that we're going to be discussing now is agape, um, also known as a universal kind of love. So by the Greeks, this was known as the most radical and esteemed. Um, it was the purest form of love, actually. Um, and the Latin meaning of this is um, charitable, which is translated from the Latin word caritos. Um, and so it's pretty much like when you say when you say charitable, it's pretty much given with no return or expectancy. Um, Christians also believe that this is the most at being the most pure form of love. Uh, Christians also believe that this is the type of love that God has a universal love just because we are merely human. Um, and so regardless of whatever bad that we do, um, God loves all of us. Um, he might not love all the things that we do, <laughs> but he loves us just individually as people. Um, and so this type of agape love is like literally like just a love for human beings in general. Like, hey, I don't know you, but because you are human and because I am human, I have a certain degree, a certain baseline type of love for you. And I believe that this is a very, this is a very pure kind of love. Um, and it could have like different levels, you know, like whatever your baseline type of love for people is, that might be an agape kind of love in my opinion. Um, but um, I believe, I think that like some people just have a naturally more agape kind of love than other people might have. But then maybe also the people who I'm thinking that might have less, they probably just don't have this form of love at all, which I guess could be liable since um, a lot of people claim they hate people and all of that and so yeah they might just be lacking that agape kind of love while a lot of people are excelling that like being able to show love and express love to everyone whether it be the homeless person on the street or co-workers or um, even just like somebody they see in class so pragma will be the fifth form of Greek love that we're gonna be talking about um, and this has the most to do with longevity um, and pretty much it's the most mature realistic and durable because it's built over time so you can kind of see like a similarity between this and maybe like philia which is like a deep friendship and everything um but pragma from my understanding is it's more of uh 
think it's more focused on the one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of love where philia may have like a little bit of like a kind of like group kind of thing um, but yeah with pragma it's more of like they like these people were more intentional if anything so like philia not that it may lack intention but i believe that pragma it's almost like pragmatic we expend too much time or energy in falling in love and need to learn to stand in love this is from eric from um and essentially when you look at that quote it makes a lot of sense because a lot of people do want to fall in love but then they like the first uh fight or few that they, they want to divorce or they want to break up and stuff like that so pragma is the love that's built um when people are actually working toward um, staying in love, when they're adding more fuel uh, and, uh, and wood fire to that fire. Um, so I believe that um, that's why it's most associated with longevity, um, because a couple or friendship that continuously builds into that bond um, is now creating a more mature and a more long-lasting bond and this is something that has to be done on both sides that's what makes it most pragmatic or pragma now philosha is going to be the sixth form of greek love that we're talking about today and this is known as self-love um so um all friendly feelings for others are an extension of a man's feelings for himself that is what aristotle said um and i believe that although like I, I would like to pick that apart. I think that that does explain like a lot of people, like how they say like you can't love other people if you don't love yourself. Um, it's almost like you can't share what you yourself do not have. Um, and so when people have this philosophy kind of love, then it's giving them a wider capacity to love other people. Um, and in doing that, then that allows them to now, like because I've learn to love myself and appreciate myself and i've learned to cater to myself i'm now having a better ability to understand how to properly cater to other people and to love other people so the seventh form of greek love that we'll be talking about is storage also known as familial love and this one is pretty self-explanatory it's kind of, it's pretty much the love that we have between parents siblings and even like pets you know, so that kind of love that um, maybe you'll see in like Stuart Little, for example, where it's like they were just a really deep knit family, um, like blood family. But I've, I, this could probably run into um, other forms of love, which I feel like some of these may overlap. And if any of you have like more like knowledge on this, then you can go ahead and say it. But like, yeah, like that could like even relate once again to like philia, where I believe that philia has more to do with like oh we've become almost like family um through the hardships that we've been through and now we are like now we have this bond together while storage is more of like no because you are my mom then inevitably like i have this specific love for you because you are my sibling i inevitably have this specific love for you oh my pet is actually like i have this love for my pet because my pet is almost like pretty much part of the family. Um, so clearly that is not a romantic kind of love. Um, it's just, okay, this is a familial type of love. Like um, you have a different type of love, hopefully, that you do for your sister than you would for your wife. And then lastly, um, the last love that we'll be discussing is mania. Um, and this one is most associated with obsessiveness. So for me, I, I view this as like the people who are very insecure and clingy and just have a very unhealthy need for validation with their love. Um, and this is, this is, this is pretty much self-explanatory. Like if you, if you have this type of like connection or this type of like bond with someone, in my opinion, that once again is very unhealthy because you are being very codependent on that person and these are the types of people who um if they aren't receiving like text messages from their significant other if they're not like in constant connection with their significant other then they become very insecure they start feeling like they're not loved they start having suicidal thoughts all of that and it's almost maniacal um and so i think that that name for this kind of love is like very fitting <laughs> hey 
Uh, I think that it's it's if you identified yourself as that, or if you have identified somebody that you know as that, uh, you should probably get some help uh, and try to like boost up out of there um, because that's pretty dangerous. But yeah, those are just a quick overview of the eight different types of love. And the biggest takeaway that I want for us to take away from this is that our relationships with each other is clearly not binary. It's not black and white. Um, when we jump hastily to assume that two people who are connecting um, on a deeper level than surface level are vibing, that now they're going to fall in love and here's the bottom line, our trio's down to two kind of thing. Like that, it doesn't always happen that way. It, that's not to say that it'll never happen. But I think that once we become more familiar with the different types of ways that we can interact and love each other and it still be platonic, like in that platonic realm of us not bleeding into romantic, then I think that that'll um, allow us to have a lot more security, not only in the relationships that we have with each other, but also maybe relationships that people that we know, such as our significant other, may have with like other people. Like, oh, okay, well, that's just the philia love that they have. It's not necessarily like romantic. And I also want us to like start like exploring some of the combinations that these different types of loves can have. Like, I believe that in a marriage, um, it's healthy to pretty much have all of these loves except mania maybe um but um hey you know if some people like crazy so i think that in a marriage like it's definitely important to have that eros kind of love like that lust for one another that sexual passion um in a way but it's kind of like balanced because it's not fleeting once you've applied um pragma with it because now you are learning to not just like jump at that impulse but you're learning to keep that um, built and like rising and like growing and then you also have like a lot of like ludus where it's not necessarily you guys are actually like trying to have sex or anything but you're just like playfully you know like doing banter with one another joking around like you know and it's just kind of like that stuff that you'll see probably like in movies and quick cute moments and just be like oh like maybe even like play fighting you know like I feel like that's another form of like ludus and then of course like philia like when you have like that deep friendship with the person i believe that that's like even though it doesn't always grow big thing it doesn't always grow into romantic um i believe that that is a very good foundation for having a romantic relationship and also of course you have to have like a self-love there um because once you have that type of like self-love for yourself then you're able to better love the other person but a lot of times you can't really receive love from other people because you yourself do not love yourself. This isn't always, but because you have not accepted how you are, because you do not necessarily love yourself, then when other people try to express love to you, then you kind of like are in denial, like, huh, yeah, right. And then that grows tiring for the person who's trying to express love to you. Um, and so, yeah, that's my take on all of this. Once again, this was just an overview kind of a discussion starter. Um, I myself, I'm gonna to continue to observe these things and maybe I'll make um, another video in the future, but um, I think it'll be pretty cool for us to see the types of combinations of love and things that we have in our interpersonal dynamics. And even uh, with um, like seeing the types of uh, interpersonal dynamics that other people have with each other. But yeah, let me know what you guys think. Leave your questions, comments, concerns. Um, and if you have like any additional thoughts, like definitely like drop those as well. Like let's all just learn together. Done.